talk is by Sandro Takela on uh, galaxy morphology uh, along the main sequence. Okay, um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity um, to present my research here. As I said, you know, I will talk about galaxy morphology and its relation um, to star formation. I will start with setting the stage with some um, observations we have done in the last few years, and then I will dig into um, the illustrious TNG simulations and some very recent results which we obtained from there. Okay, so when we look at the local universe, even at the given mass, we see actually a large diversity of galaxies. We see most of the galaxies have some kind of a dynamically hot component in their center is a spheroid component, um, and some other galaxies have a disk component. And usually we can see that you know, this is, of course, going very well with star formation. So we can see that you know, a lot of the spheroid dominated galaxies are kind of coalescent galaxies, while the star forming galaxies usually have their star formation taking place in a disk. Now, in my talk, I will focus on these two main questions. So the first one is really kind of which physical mechanisms govern the radial assembly um, of stellar mass growth in galaxies. And the second part uh, will be more on how the spheroidal components in galaxies build up with time, and in particular also the link with star formation activity. Now, when we look at redshift zero, um, we see kind of you know, very nice um, scaling relations and correlations. But I think it's, it's sometimes very um, challenging to interpret those because when we actually look at in such an image or in general in data, it's actually an integration of 13.7 you know, billion years of cosmic time. And so one has to be very careful with what one infers at redshift zero. And so one thing we started to looking into is actually galaxies at, with very high redshift, so get, you know, at the peak of cosmic star formation rate density at redshifts of two. And so this work has been on close collaboration uh, with many people. Many people are also here, um, you know, including people, um, Reinhard Kenzel, Natasha Furster Schreiber, Lina Tacconi, uh, Marcella Carola, as well as Simon Lilly and Alvar Enzin and the whole Synth Set Synth team. And so what we've put together is a unique sample of galaxies at redshift of two. We talk here of about 35 galaxies, where we try to really zoom in on the details of these galaxies on kiloparsec scale, trying to understand what really the internal workings of such galaxies are. And so what we do is we combine Hubble Space Telescope imaging, so kind of imaging you know, that we also obtain from candles, and basically using B up to H band, the traces read the rest frame, far UV, near UV, as well as optical light. And so this imaging you know, helps us to constrain the stellar mass distribution as well as the dust attenuation um, in these galaxies. But I think what make, makes our sample really unique is a very large program we had at the VLT um, with Symfony. So Symfony is an IFU, so we can you know, basically get a spectra for each individual pixel. And so we use this to trace the H-alpha emission line as well as the N2 emission lines in, in these galaxies. And so important to highlight is that this is in adaptive optics mode. And so we can basically get a very similar spatial resolution as with HSD, roughly on a one to two kiloparsec scale. And so we use this to trace the H-alpha emission line, which is a good star formation rate indicator, as well as actually the kinematics of these galaxies. So we can understand what the, kind of the, the, the kinematical state of such objects is. One thing that I was very curious in, 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 in studying in these galaxies, basically looking at the specific growth rate of these galaxies. So what I show you here is the specific star formation rate in H-alpha, dust corrected. Basically, this is just the star formation rate surface density divided by the stellar mass surface density as a function of radius. And so on average, we see that the intermediate mass galaxies between 10 to the 10 and 10 to 11 solar masses shown here in blue are roughly flat. And so this indicates that you're doubling your mass roughly every 300 million years in the central core and in the outskirts. And so when you think about, you know, like stellar mass distribution, basically they evolve similarly at all radius. Now, we can also look into the more massive galaxies between 10 to 11, 10 to 11.5 solar masses. And what we find there is that, you know, basically the specific star formation drops into the central core and the mass doubling time scale is longer than the Hubble time. And so these galaxies are still forming stars in their cores, but they do this at rates that, you know, that doesn't produce enough solar mass to really alter the solar mass density in their central cores. And so, so this is all redshift of two at the moment. Um, and so when we look into this, uh, we, what we infer is that basically these galaxies are, you know, very massive. And so they are, you know, switching off their star formation and do this from an inside out fashion. And, you know, when we look into, um, you know, basically the broad line of H-alpha, we can see that when we go to these massive galaxies, that the broad component um, of the H-alpha emission line in the center is much larger than the one, you know, in the outskirts. And so this indicates that there are um, powerful nuclear outflows in these galaxies, possibly triggered by some HEN. And I think Reinhard Gensel will be talking more about this in his talk. 
when we look into the kinematics, we see that you know, many of these massive galaxies are you know, rotationally supported. They have V over sigma of roughly five, or you know, thereabout. And so it seems that there is a lot of rotation in these systems. And so the picture we came up with is that you're building up a very dense center, and you know, one viable mechanism is, go, is through compaction, I think. Um, Sharon Lapiner will be talking more about this in her talk. But basically, you build up your central cores, and then you're you know, basically quenching from the inside out in these galaxies. And because you have a lot of rotation in these systems, um, you are forming basically a typical early type um, star galaxy, with, you know, which is rotationally supported. But of course, there are you know, remaining open questions, because what we are basically tracing here is, is the ionized gas. So we are you know, still not really sure what um, how hot the underlying stars are, as well as the second question is like, you know, basically from here to here, you know, of course, if these galaxies are in kind of dense environments, you would expect that there is a lot of merging going on. And so there could be, you know, basically some effect of this um, evolution towards lower redshifts. And so I, I tried to look into this more with the Luster's TNG simulations recently. And so this is in collaboration uh, with Benedict Diemer, as well as Lars Hernquist at the CFA. Um, but also the whole TNG team, of course, must be mentioned, in particular uh, Bill and Nelson, as well as Annalisa Filipic, who really lead this whole effort. And so what's new in respect to Illustris is basically an implementation of the growth and feedback of supermassive black holes, as well as galactic winds, which makes galaxies being you know, more efficiently quenched at the highest masses, you know, at 10 to 11 and thereabout. And so, you know, I was just want to mention that, you know, these basically some observations have been used to basically tune or roughly tune these um, simulations. I list them here, in particular, star formation rate density, um, the stellar mass functions at redshift zero, the stellar to halo mass relation at redshift zero, as well as, you know, the black hole to halo mass relation, the halo gas fraction. And I think for this talk, important, the galaxy sizes. And so, you know, if you go now and compare these simulations with these observations, um, you know, we find quite good agreement, of course. But what is not being tuned to basically is morphology, and with morphology today I will focus really on the kinematic part of morphology, looking at the sphere of the you know, bulge component to total ratio, basically. Um, and so to this relation, um, or to this, um, you know, basically tracer, um, it has not been tuned to. So I will be focusing on sp um, specifically central galaxies now, above masses of 10 to 9 solar masses, and as I said, this is work in progress, so if you have any comments, I'm very happy to receive those. So what I show you here, basically, is um, a color mass diagram. So this is G minus R color as a function of total mass at redshift zero. And so you can see just the general distribution. And um, Dylan also shows in this paper that this overall agrees quite well with what we see in, um, in observations. Basically, you see here the blue clouds. Here are the star-forming galaxies. They transition through a green valley, and then they are up here on the red sequence, basically. What I show you here um, as a color code is basically going from, you know, the S over T, the sphero to total ratio, going from zero, which is disks, to spherot components only. And you can see that there's a lot of diversity, even when you look at the quiescent objects, basically. You know, there are quite a few um, quiescent disk galaxies, and then, you know, when you go maybe to more massive galaxies, you see that there are more and more spherots appearing. Also, when we look into the disk galaxy in general, you see that they are basically in this mass scale between 10 to the 10 to 10 to 11 solar masses. And the sphere of the total basically increases again for galaxies going to lower masses. Now, um, we can look into how these galaxies really look, you know, in the simulation. So I'll show you a few images at the same given mass. Basically, this is a 10 to the 10.6 10 10 solar mass galaxy. Star form, you can see a nice the spiral patterns. You're going up in, in basically color. So this is now a redder, you know, quiescent object. You can see clearly that, you know, there's a dominant um, sphere component. But basically, at the same color, at the same mass, you can also find galaxies that are more disk-like. Now we can look into this as a function of redshift. So here, you know, as redshift zero, now we go to redshift one, redshift two, and the first thing you notice is basically, like, you know, as expected, that the colors get bluer. This is just because galaxies are getting younger towards higher redshifts. And you can see that there are fewer and fewer quiescent galaxies going to um, higher redshifts. Again, you can also observe when you go to lower masses, basically, that the sphere to total ratio um, increases for these low mass um, objects, which can be interpreted as kind of, you know, disk settling from redshift two to redshift zero. Maybe a bit more, um, you know, a more, a more quantitative, but not totally quantitative comparison. So again, this is a very rough comparison to um, some observations at redshift zero. So this is basically the fraction of stellar mass that is in the spheroid component, okay? So these are observations um, from the gamma survey by Moffat et al. And so basically what they do is they add up what is in elliptical galaxies as well as in bulges of star-forming and quiescent galaxies, and they add this to the sphere component. 
Um, and then they can, you know, they add or, or basically ignore, you know, in one way they add the irregular galaxies as being, you know, part of the spheroid mass. And in one they, they, they kind of exclude those. Now when we do our spheroid total, you know, basically mass estimates, we get this Ryan curve, which is overall in rough agreement. So that as we said, at the high masses we see many spheroids as well as at lower masses. And, you know, basically disks are dominating this intermediate mass scale. And again, this mass scale of roughly 10 to the 10, where you see these disks uh, being you know, more and more assembled, is actually quite consistent with what, you know, we put forward with, with the compaction scenario, where after compaction you build up these central bulges, and then you are able to kind of have a more um, coherently rotating disks around that. Um, going now further, we can look into, of course, what drives this um, sphere to total ratio. And so what I show you here is basically the exit to stellar mass fraction. So, you know, how much exit to mass is there? in a given mass bin for, for the galaxies. And you see that, you know, basically it's very close to zero up to 10 to the 10.5 solar masses. So, you know, most of the stars are formed in C2 in these galaxies. And only when you go to 10 to 11.5 or 10 to 11, you see that this is a quite sharp increase. And it's quite interesting, it's nearly you're independent of redshift. Now there is quite some difference to illustrious, um, you know, which we have also heard um, this morning talked about. Um, and I think one of the main reasons for this difference is because in illustrious, and the galaxies are quenching not that efficiently, and so they are overall forming, you know, more, more stars in situ. In last year's TNG, basically, because of, you know, the changed black hole feedback, galaxies are quenching more efficiently, and therefore, overall, you know, at, at these high masses, then, don't form the stars anymore in situ, but actually re-accrete or accrete these masses to really, you know, achieve these high, high um, ex situ masses. Um, now, of course, you want to understand how is this is correlated with the sphero to total ratio. So what I show you here is the sphero to total as a function of stellar mass. And each bin, basically, um, in, in this 2D plane, has a color based on the ex situ fraction. And so again, you can see the mass trend. And when you go to higher masses, you can overall see that you know, the ex situ mass fractions increase. And then when you look at the given mass, you can see some, but not very strong, dependence on the ST of the sphero of total. So basically, when you go to higher sphere to total ratios, these galaxies have usually a bit higher ex situ fractions, but this is not a very strong trend, and so currently I'm still looking into this to understand, you know, is there another story to this, um, what really drives the sphere to total ratio, um, because it seems like, you know, this is maybe a first order trend, but maybe there are other trends as well in the data. Um, I quickly want to talk about quiescent galaxies, so what I, what I show you here basically is when we choose quiescent galaxies at redshift zero, okay, we take quiescent galaxies at redshift zero, in two mass bins. One is a 10 to 11, and one is a 10 to 11.5. So we can kind of very massive and the kind of intermediate mass. And then the question is, how do these galaxies evolve, in, you know, kind of on average in certain planes? And so what I show you here is focused on the color versus sphero to total plane. So you can see that these galaxies at higher redshift were both, you know, kind of star, you know, all of them were star forming. So these are median tracks through time, going from redshift 5 all up to redshift 0. And so you see that they were very blue, they were having rather high sphere to total ratios at early times. And they basically then, they were able to form more and more disk structures. And so you see sphere to total ratio basically decreased. And when they went to the quenching regime going through the Green Valley, you see that basically the lower mass objects, they end up being roughly quenching at the same sphere to total ratio, whereas the more massive galaxies, they basically changed their, you know, sphere to total ratio while they were still quenching. And we look into this and how this correlates with FX C2. Um, and you see that basically the more massive galaxies consistent with basically the diagram before changed um, their ex situ mass fraction more significantly than the lower mass galaxies. Okay, last but not least, I want to discuss um, very briefly um, quiescent disk galaxies. So this is basically from observation. So there has been, you know, quite many galaxies been observed to be quiescent disks. Um, numbers of quiescent disk fractions are somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. And as I said, we also find some of these galaxies um, in illustrious TNG. And so what I show you here is basically the fraction of quiescent galaxies that are disks, okay? So this is really, you know, you look at the quiescent galaxies and you ask how many of those are disks. And what I show you here is data from, from the literature, from, from different people. Um, the differences um, arise um, because they use different data sets, but also because they use um, different cuts in what a disk is. You know, some of them do a bulge disk decomposition and cut based on this. Some people do a visual morphology and so on. But overall, you can see that observations show that somewhere between, you know, the disk fraction, somewhere between 20 and 20% um, at all redshifts. And when we now look into different cuts, you know, in illustrious TNG, but basically it's a very similar story that we always see of this order, a rather, you know, rather constant, a quiescent disk fraction. And the question is, of course, you know, what, what is really behind that? Is it because, you know, 
how, do these quiescent disks actually just remain quiescent disks through time, or do they basically change their morphology? And do you have to sustain many more newly quenched galaxies that are disks at later epochs? And so in order to look into this, I choose quiescent disk galaxies at redshift 1. And so you know, just by a spherical total cut of less than 0.4, at redshift 1, you know, around 10 to 11 solar masses. And I ask the question, how do these galaxies evolve forward in time? And so you can see now, you know, basically this is the sphere of the total distribution at redshift 1, and this is the one for the same galaxies at redshift 0. And the basic outcome of this, this is only that 2, I mean 5% um, remain quiescent disks. Most of them actually increase the sphere of the total ratio. 20% of them, you know, a little bit, but actually 33% significantly. And so what happens is that these galaxies stay quiescent, but what they do basically, they add, you know, basically they change the morphology will be more as sphero dominated at later epochs. Okay, I skipped that, and this is the conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, questions? Yeah, Joel. Uh, so two, uh, actually a question and a comment. So uh, as you mentioned, it could very well be that these small steroids that you're seeing at masses of around 10 to the 9.5 are the compaction phenomenon uh, that we see observationally and also in some simulations. Have you looked at the simulations to see if they're actually gas inflow to the center uh, and a conversion from being dark matter dominated in the center to being stellar dominated? Uh, the comment is, uh, the new paper that Hao Wen Zhang led, which is on the archive for a couple months now, uh, tells you bin by bin in stellar mass, redshift, axis ratio B over A, and uh, size, uh, long axis A, uh, what the fraction is of each different morphology, prolate, spheroidal, mm -hmm. oblate. You could compare that with the TNG results now that you've done the morphology, and it'd yep. be interesting to see, because the, the, the uh, data is candles, yep. uh, and uh, it should be, I mean, we think we're pretty complete, yep. uh, and so it should be possible to compare directly, and see, have you attempted to do that, or is that on your uh, yeah. agenda? I think I, I would like to do a more careful comparison. There is also the work by Vicente, you know, who looks really into the detailed comparison of, like, you know, basically forward modeling the light, and then doing the same kind of morphology measures as observers do. So I think I do a, a kind of a rougher comparison than that, but I for sure will you know, look into that work. Concerning the, the profiles, I, I started looking into that. The thing is that you know, these are rather low resolution simulations still. We're talking of a smoothing scale of you know, a bit below than a kiloparsec. And so I wouldn't trust too much um, the details of these profiles, but I, I started looking into that and I can show you a few of those if you're interested. Exactly, so the 50 box, that's for sure on, on, on my to-do list if I can to, to look into that, yeah. Yeah, Kevin. You had a plot with spheroid to total fraction evolving over time for two mass bins. In the higher mass bin, the spheroid fraction went up for that particular galaxy, and then it looked like there was a greater ex situ fraction as well but I kind of missed the link between the ex situ and the morpho morphological transition. Yes, so these are, these are median trends for the whole, basically, a whole bin. So these are, you know, 100 galaxies now. And so I, I need to look into the details, you know, of like, you know, how for each individual galaxy this, this kind of goes. But it seems that um, basically for, for these galaxies down here, the ex situ mass fraction changes very, you know, only very slightly. And it seems that when they quench, basically the sphere to total ratio doesn't change really. But for those galaxies, you can see that you know, it jumps significantly going from here to here by the ex situ fraction. And it seems that this is, is maybe driving one part of, of the story. But again, you see that you know, both of them change their ex situ fraction. So I don't think it's the simple link that you can just look into the ex situ fraction and predict the, the sphere to total ratio. I think there is, is more to that. Mm. I will ask a question. So if I understood properly regarding the quiescent disks, you see that they get quiescent uh, and, that's, and then they increase the bulge to total radio. Yes. So do you have ideas uh, both of how these galaxies are quenched? Is something like strangulation or something like that that doesn't change? And how then they grow their B over T? Yes. So, so the galaxies really quench because of their black hole feedback. So what happens is basically these are all central galaxies. And so basically when they, you know, when they reach um, kind of a higher black hole mass, what happens is that the feedback gets much more efficient. And so then these galaxies quench. And they end up with a, you know, a very disky morphology. 
And, and afterwards, they, they remain quiescent. But you know, one has to see that you know, about 40% of them merge into larger halos or merge into other galaxies. Um, but 33 and 20%, so basically 50% of them really change their sphere of the total ratio significantly. And I'm currently wondering you know, what, what is driving that. I think that um, you know, the XC to mass uh, is, is part of the story. But you see there is a large scatter between uh, basically how much you increase the mass in the sphere component versus how much you know, mass you increase by in the, in the XC2 component. And so you see these galaxies down here. And so it could even be that you know, it has to do something with internal like secular processes in these galaxies. So this is something I, I'm currently looking into. Supermassive black holes with B over, with bulges, uh, with B over T lower than 0 0.23. So this, is, so you, this is what you said, right? I mean, the black hole masses that are in these systems are um, you know, 10 to the 8.4 or so. Last, last question. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious how exactly your, and we, you don't have to go into the details, uh, but your, your kinetic uh, definition of spheroid, yes. uh, how does that account for, I mean, especially at early times, these low masses, your spheroid component is going to have a scale length much smaller than your resolution limit. So how, how confident are you in your, in your spheroid mass estimates for these lower mass galaxies and also at high redshift, which seems really difficult to do at kiloparsec resolution? Yes, so um, it's, it's a good question. So um, overall, we think that, you know, we, we talk here always of, of things that are larger than, um, you know, basically I look into the spheroid component within um, three effective radii. And so the effective radii is of the order of, of the kiloparsec at these redshifts and, you know, at these masses. And so, you know, it is marginally resolved. I agree with that. But if you look at low resolution runs, you know, basically the sphere or total ratio for these low mass objects doesn't change. And so, of course, you know, this is not a very clear, you know, indication whether it's converged or not. So I think, again, when we look into the TNG 50 box with the same physical recipes, I think we can see whether, you know, basically the sphere or the total ratio would come down for these low mass as well as high redshift objects. But I, I agree with this. It's also something on the to-do list, yeah. We have a battery problem, so we can take one more question. Um, I was wondering, when you include the ex situ, do you also include the possibility that they uh, contribute to maybe like a thick disk, and whether the thick disk is actually an important part of the story that you might be able to also reveal? Yeah, I don't think I want to make a statement about the thick disk because it's really low resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Just because we were talking about dwarf ellipticals this morning, you were mainly focused at higher mass. So do, do we have any dwarf elliptical satellites? Have you looked? I haven't looked. That's right. interesting, yeah. I, I just focused on centrals, but I agree with you. It made sense. And also for, um, you know, 50 bucks, basically. Yeah. Okay. So let's thank Sandra again.